We're delighted today to have Dr. Gordon Hugenberger, Senior Professor of Old Testament, share God's Word with us in a concluding sermon called The Soul-Thrilling, but invariably neglected, Background for Imputed Righteousness. At the end of Dr. Hugenberger's sermon, Dan will lead us in a closing hymn. So please welcome Dr. Gordon Hugenberger. I was hoping that sermon would imply that we're lowering the bar of expectation, not <laughs> raising it. I might have better uh, uh, describe this as a, a meditation, a few thoughts, something like that would be fine. But let's begin with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for the remarkable blessing that is ours, that you have loved us with an everlasting love in Christ. We pray, O oh God, that you would enable us to be delivered from the folly of self-reliance, the despicable sins of pride, arrogance, and all that separates us from you. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would learn because of our meditation together to depend more on you and to love you more and to live for you who died for us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I have a meditation that is very loosely linked to four ladders or stairways. Uh, and as you hear them mentioned, they're not like exactly headings uh, for the message, but you'll see that they actually do kind of encapsulate what it is I want to say. Uh, this is our uh, quincentennial celebration uh, of the birth of the Reformation of the Protestant movement and uh, the date of October 31, as you've discovered from the many talks we've heard, uh, is very arbitrary. Uh, when you uh, read those 95 theses, uh, well, the first two have already been quoted a lot. And, uh, you know, there are a couple that are quite inspiring. Uh, others seem kind of irrelevant to our current situation. And, and uh, so if you, well, on the one hand, if you are really thriving on this celebration. Uh, I have good news for you. You could choose another date, uh, March 28 uh, in 2018, as a continued celebration, maybe a more adequate celebration for the birthday of the Reformation, because that is the quincentennial of Martin Luther's sermon on the two righteousnesses, uh, two kinds of righteousness, he says. There are two kinds of Christian Christian righteousness, just as man's sin is of two kinds. Uh, there is the uh, imputed kind, the inherited sin of Adam imputed to us, and then there is our personal sin, and in the same way then uh, Luther sets out the two kinds of righteousness. One that is the alien righteousness, as he calls it, the righteousness that comes from Christ and is uh, attributed to us, imputed to us, and the other is our own uh, acts uh, in response to that righteousness of good works, uh, growing in Christ's likeness, developing the fruit of the Spirit as he describes it, and so on, and links the two. Now, admittedly, in 1518, uh, as we've also heard in the earlier period, uh, Luther's views of justification were not uh, the fully developed view that came later on, uh, seeing justification as a punctiliar, a definitive act uh, at the beginning of our walk with God rather than progressive. Uh, in this earlier stage, he still had this progressive idea. So maybe that's not the best birthday. Uh, if you didn't, if you're kind of wishing that you just got out during the break a moment ago, uh, thought you've already celebrated enough, uh, you could choose as a quincentennial uh, 2010. In other words, it's past. Uh, and in a way, that would be my preference, because that is the turning point in Luther, at least as I see it, where although he hadn't yet got a hold of the gospel and the way it later uh, was articulated by him, he at least lost his faith in himself. Uh, you can't come to Christ and believe in Christ until you first disbelieve that you are God on earth, uh, or that your works are meritorious and capable of conveying merit. And of course, that's what happened in this 
really distressing experience that he had. In 1510, he was sent to Rome as an ambassador of his uh, cloister, and uh, he had, uh, was just looking forward to it with such excitement. This was his first such trip. Uh, he expected that he would, with every free moment, uh, celebrate Mass at each holy shrine he found. The city of Rome was filled with them, that he would venerate every bone from a saint or a martyr, or every piece of hair or whatever, that in every, every turn, every corner. Uh, and uh, he would uh, venerate every holy relic he could. Uh, in, in the course of that, on a particular day we can't date, uh, outside the Vatican, he went as he was eagerly looking forward to, to the Scala Sancta, the Holy Stairs. These are 28 white marble stairs, which according to the Catholic tradition were once located in Jerusalem in the fourth century because of uh, Constantine's mother uh, were brought to, Jer to uh, Rome. Uh, the very stairs that Jesus ascended uh, when he went to be tried before Pilate. And in Luther's day, and even to this day, uh, it was believed that there would be tremendous merit if you were to ascend those stairs in devotion. Uh, the rule was not to walk up them, but to go up on those marble stairs on your knees. I, I've tried doing that. Uh, if you do it quickly, it isn't too painful. But in this case, it is painful because what you're to do, and what, in fact, Luther did, was stop at each stair and pray the Lord's Prayer, and then just for good measure, as is, was his want to always over-obey, he would then kiss each stair before moving to the next stair on your knees. And it was believed that if you did that, it would result in genuine merit. You would either release a, uh, a soul from purgatory, or you yourself would be having your temporal punishments for sin uh, uh, much uh, uh, reduced. And after doing so, Luther, in reflecting on this afterward, says that although he at that point wasn't doubting the existence of purgatory, in fact, continued to believe in purgatory for two decades until at last he uh, wrote against it, uh, suddenly he wondered when he got to the top, who knows whether this is so? It just, it, it just all of a sudden, having seen by this point all the uh, decadence, all the evidences of uh, spiritual uh, emptiness and shallowness that was going on in Rome at the time, uh, that together with just going through this act, somehow or other, his belief structure was falling apart. So I would call that the beginning of the Protestant Reformation, the beginning of disbelieving in yourself. Obviously, the whole concept of these spiritual acts is a concept based on the recognition that there's an infinite separation between human beings and the creator of the universe. Uh, how can what is finite be in fellowship with what's infinite? How can what is material be in fellowship with what's spiritual? What can explain, the, how is it possible for that which is utterly sinful and offensive to be in fellowship with one who is incorruptibly holy. Unfortunately, it turns out that true spirituality, that bridging of the gap between the infinite holy God and you and me, uh, isn't going to be accomplished uh, through our works. False spirituality is characterized by what is your responsibility, what you're supposed to do to somehow or other bridge this gap. It's not so much justification by faith then that uh, in the end uh, Luther became the champion of, but justification by grace through faith. R faith isn't a work that then causes God to justify us that's in some sense then meritorious. It's the empty hands of reception uh, for the work of justification, God's a declaration of righteousness that we receive. Uh, it's not that it's wrong to climb stairs on your knees or to do any of the other many things we do to seek to be edified in some way and enhance our worship. It's folding our hands when we pray or do whatever we do. Uh, it's, it's all how we view these works that is the problem. 
Our Lord Jesus, on one occasion, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Notice that he is thanking God. Uh, it's not that he's patting himself on the back. He's, con he's, he's genuinely expressing gratitude to God for whatever God has done to intervene, to make it the case, give him better background or whatever, so that he would not be like other men, that is, robbers, evildoers, and adulterers, or even like this tax collector, this collaborator with the enemy. And then after talking about his moral rectitude and thanking God for it, he now turns to his uh, spiritual disciplines. Uh, and he looks at them and, and announces, I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all that I get. These aren't uh, evidences, these are not moral uh, laws in the Old Testament. The moral law was whatever makes us look like God, but God doesn't tithe. Uh, and he, he doesn't fast either, as a matter of fact, and he doesn't do a lot of things that he requires us to do uh, in terms of devotional life. But, but it's how you view it. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat on his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. Uh, justification isn't something reserved for the book of Romans. Here it is already in the gospel, and it's now Jesus announcing in, two, in a very stark contrast between these two individuals which one goes home justified, declared righteous by God. And it's the one who, beating on his breast, cried out, God have mercy on me, a sinner. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So Christian spiritual theology, working out uh, how our relationship uh, works with God uh, is one that starts with this, that it, it isn't anything that we do, whether moral rectitude or spiritual disciplines, that gets us into better graces with God. That has not been the case, however, of course, in the history of Christianity, uh, a, a, an insight that was uh, firmly uh, uh, lived out. Uh, in the period of the 12th century and beyond, you had the Anchorites, the early monastic movement, people withdrawing from society. Uh, and they had what they called the ladder of perfection. And some of them described it as the ladder of divine ascent or the ladder of paradise. And they're, of course, playing off of Jacob's ladder. And the idea was that if you did these things, and at the beginning, they were rather simple. Uh, the Anchorites were particularly keen on just meditating on the word of God. Uh, get free from the distractions, get away. Uh, a lot of times they would live in isolation from others. And, and just, well, we could call it like seminary. Uh, and those who have gone through seminary, oddly enough, don't often consider this the high watermark of their spiritual uh, life with God. Uh, it, it almost seems the opposite for some. Uh, it turns out that the spiritual ladder the ladder of perfection, divine ascent, Jacob's ladder, isn't all that's advertised, even though these well-intended anchorites thought they had the formula. In the Counter-Reformation, in response to uh, uh, Luther, you had St. John of the Cross, for example, kind of the leading figure, uh, talking about that dark night of the soul that we were just reminded of, that instant, that moment, that experience where you are acutely aware of the separation between you and your holy God a feeling that there's like an infinite gap between human nature and God's wisdom and light. And unfortunately, while that's a great thing to get a hold of, St. John of the Cross then proceeds to give you the 10 steps, uh, the ladder of ascent to God for what to do with that. And that is the first step. The first step is in fact the dark night of the soul. It is to be spiritually hungry it's, in fact, to be lovesick for God. When you're lovesick, you lose your appetite for everything else. You're just thinking of your beloved. And in the same way, at that first ladder step, you, you cultivate that dark night of the soul in this way. You shape it. You recognize that the reason you don't feel like, uh, you know, getting up in the morning or you're eating or uh, playing 
computer games anymore. Is that you, there's something else you're crying out for and in anguish about. And, but then you move to the second run, and then you start searching for God without ceasing. Uh, like the Song of Songs, the beloved, I will rise up and seek him whom my soul uh, loves, uh, drawing inspiration from the Song of Songs. And the third run is then learning, uh, well, as Jacob did, uh, learning to view all your labors as nothing because of your beloved, the one you're winning uh, because of your acts. Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, and they seem like only a few days. And so all the hard work you do, washing dishes or whatever it is, just are nothing. And you cultivate that mindset. Well, anyway, we could go on to the 10 steps. Uh, but, you know, we're not free from this either among the evangelical world. I went online, I realized, well, my goodness, Lee Roberts has published a book, Three Easy Steps for a Closer Walk with God. Uh, and then there's Michael Pipes, seven steps to a closer walk. And then there's David Showers, 10 steps to a closer walk with God. Don Humphrey, 12 steps for a closer walk with God. <laughs> Glenn Martin and Diane Ginter have drawn closer a step-by-step -step guide to intimacy with God. It's just 242 pages. Uh, it, it, it's like, it, and that probably all the recommend, I haven't read any of those books, I admit it. Probably they are full of great recommendations that worked well for the authors. But to then normalize it for everyone else and turn it into a rule on how you can, a recipe for getting close to God, therein lies the danger. It's certainly far from and far more complicated than what happened when the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. And then the Savior gave them a prayer that even when you're praying it slowly, takes less than one minute. Climbing the steps of Sancta, Scala Sancta, the Holy Stairs, the 10 step ladder of ascent toward God for St. John of the Cross. What's it all have to do with Jacob's ladder? Because all of these works allude to Jacob's ladder or his stairway as its inspiration. It turns out it's true that they're all working with the same problem. But Jacob's ladder in the book of Genesis comes up with the diametrically opposite solution. And so we need to look at it. It's chapter 28. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. And you know the context. He had just cheated his brother out of his inheritance. He had uh, blasphemed, lying to his father, trying to swear that he is, in fact, Esau, and so on. And now he's on the run. When he reached a certain place, 50, 60 miles away, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. So he wasn't on his way to a prayer meeting or anything like that. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down asleep. And he had a dream in which he saw a ladder, is the way the King James used to translate it, now increasingly because of ancient Near Eastern parallels, a stairway, a stairway resting on the earth. The, the Hebrew word only occurs once. Uh, and so the meaning, it has to be drawn from cognate languages. It turns out the Akkadian gives a better support for stairway. Besides the ladder going up to heaven, I mean, what's it resting on, right? A stairway is what you want. <laughs> he saw a stairway and resting on the earth and its top reaching in heaven. By the way, that language is only found in one other passage in the whole Bible, and that's Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel. And in fact, that also is a stairway. That's a ziggurat that's described there, a step pyramid. And the step pyramids in the ancient world, virtually every city, every city, particularly in Mesopotamia, was really a temple city. It was all about the temple. It was a temple complex. And next to every temple, if you could afford it, just like if you can afford it with every church, you have a steeple, with every church, with every uh, temple in Mesopotamia, if you can afford it, there would be a ziggurat. And the ziggurat was not for the worshipers because the steps were rather, well, you know, wouldn't meet the requirements of the building code for at least around here. The first step, well, we know the one in, in uh, Babylon, the first step was 100 feet tall. Uh, that's a very high riser, you know, it, right? And then the next one's 50 and then 20, and it causes a, an optical illusion as they get up to the top. Some of them went seven steps, five steps was another common number that as they get smaller and smaller toward the top, it gives, in this optical illusion, a sense of this thing has its top in the skies. You walk around it, you're just, ugh, 
architecturally, it was a, 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 a really amazing accomplishment and did exactly what was intended. This is a stairway. You imagine the stairs are all of equal size, so it looks like they're going up even way up higher than they were. And at the very top, there's a t receiving temple for the god. And no, no one's allowed to go up there. Uh, just the priests, they're like hidden stairs going up for him. But up there is where the god touches down on planet Earth, kind of like a heliport. And then he or she walks down to the main temple at the next to it, adjacent to this steeple, and is there to bless you. Well, Jacob is running to Mesopotamia, and no wonder this dream idea it may be in his mind. He's thinking about what he's going to soon be seeing, actually. Only now he's seeing the real one. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on earth with its top reaching to the heavens, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And there above it st stood the Lord, is the way some translations render it, but increasingly, even the Jewish Publication Society translation, among others, and just then, you know, those of you who know Hebrew, wehene, and just then, the Lord was standing beside him. So the old translations imagine that you have this height in order to stress the uh, uh, transcendence and exalted uh, glory of God. He's up there. But that's not the point. Point is, he's come down. In the Hebrew, actually, it's better translated. And just then, the angels are going up and down, and just then, the Lord himself has come down, and he's right next to Jacob. This runaway uh, uh, should be con. All right? Uh, there, right just then, the Lord was standing beside him. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac. I will give you your... You and your descendants, the land on which you are lying, your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you. There, he's right there. Not, I'm, you know, I, can, I can see you from up here. Don't worry. Uh, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you. I'm right here. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going to leave you until I have done what I promised you. When Jacob awoke, woke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. See, it wasn't a sanctuary. It was a place you wouldn't have expected. It was a, 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 a traffic jam on Route 128. Uh, it, was some, it was something else, just anything, where you didn't expect it. You can't write a book for, you know, step one, get into a track of jam. And, or no, you, just he was running away. God touches down on earth, and he wasn't even aware of it. He was afraid and said, "How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven." Uh, it, it's not that Jacob uh, is, by the way, being invited to ascend the stair. Well, he doesn't go up. Uh, he doesn't piggy, if he would, I guess he'd have to piggyback on the angels or something, right? He, he, it's not like he's asked to go up. It's God has come down. It's all of God. The, the lesson of the ladder is the opposite of those medieval ladders. It starts with not we are climbing Jacob's ladder. I like the, you know, the folk hymn. But that's not the right way to understand it. We're not climbing Jacob's ladder. God has, it's not a, a lesson of ascent, it's descent. God comes down into our situation, into our mess, when we do not deserve it. It's the lesson of condescension, not of ascension. The sovereign initiative of divine grace is taught by the original Jacob's Ladder, and it's been distorted into its very opposite. Uh, it's God is present even when we're unaware of the fact, as he says. It's God who will never leave us or forsake us, his promise. And you say, well, I wish I could have dreams like that. I'd have a much better life uh, if I could be reminded of this from time to time. But of course, uh, we've got better than the dream. We have the reality. And the reality is, of course, what Jesus said to Nathaniel. Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You shall see greater things than these. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, you shall see the heavens open and the angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. The Son of Man is the stairway to heaven, and he has come down. He's saying, he's using the same vocabulary as Jacob's ladder. He's saying, or Jacob's stairway, I am the stairway. And when Jacob named it the house of God or the gate of God, Jesus says, I'm the gate. I'm the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is the stairway, and he's come down. He's the gate. He's everything that Jacob experienced on that occasion, and he's the one who takes the initiative. He finds us. He says, come, follow us. Follow me. We don't say, can we come and follow you? The promise of his abiding presence, I will not leave you or forsake you. I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Well, let's get back. Where were we dealing with uh, with, uh, Luther? Let's get back to Luther. So Luther talks about justification. And he comes to the insight that there is both a subtractive and an additive nature to the work of justification. The subtractive one is the one that when I came to faith through the ministry of the Salvation Army, really, I admit, that's all I, they may have said it, but that was all I heard. All I heard was about the subtractive, glorious subtractive work that Christ takes away our guilt, takes away our sin, endures on the cross the full penalty of it. Well, you get it, right? That's John 3.16, or he was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. The subtractive work. And the subtractive work of justification and salvation is something that the Old Testament gives enormous uh, preparation for. For instance, in the entire sacrificial system. Uh, All symbolic, of course. Hebrews says that actually the blood of bulls and goats doesn't take away sin. But it did take away guilt for what we would not call sin. For example, if I bumped into a leper, I would need to have a sacrifice, a sin offering or a guilt offering, and the animal would die. I'd confess the sin of bumping into the uh, uh, leper, and the pollution would, in effect, devolve onto the animal, and then the animal would forfeit its life and pay the penalty. Uh, That's what happened in the Old Testament. No one ever thought sins, actual sins, required I mean, things like adultery would require the death of an animal. Read Psalm 51. If you desire to sacrifice, I'd give it. But that doesn't count for real sin. It only counts for symbolic sin. It only counts for inadvertencies. Read the opening chapters of Leviticus. It counts for when you yawn and bump into your neighbor like that. Now you have to kill a goat. (laughs) But if you actually go over and smash them like that, there's no sacrifice for that. You've got to go to the courts, you have to make restitution, and then you better beg God for forgiveness. Uh, But the symbols were eloquent. The Passover lamb, and now Christ fulfilling it. Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Okay, you get all that. By the way, N.T. Wright, Tom Wright, also gets it, and he fully uh, affirms the imputation of our sin onto Jesus at the cross, paying in full for our sin. But as you may be aware, the new perspective denies the other, the additive part, where Christ's righteousness gets imputed to us. The good news that God justifies the wicked by the means of imputed righteousness received by faith. Then we go back to this sermon of the two righteousness. There are two kinds of Christian righteousness, Luther writes. Just as man's sin is of two kinds, original in our own, ratifying that we would have done no better than Adam uh, if we had been there. The first is alien righteousness, that is the righteousness of another, instilled from without. This is the righteousness of Christ by which he justifies through faith. Keeping in mind, justify means pronouncing righteous. As it is written, he's God who, he is the one whom God made our wisdom, our righteousness, and sanctification and redemption. He's quoting from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Christ is my righteousness. He's your righteousness, according to Paul. He, he is himself. When you receive Christ, you receive everything that is Christ. In fact, Luther uses a very uh, engaging 
metaphor of marriage. Just as a bridegroom possesses all that is his bride's, and she all that is his. For the two have all things in common, because they are one flesh. So Christ and the church are one spirit. Thus the blessed God and Father of mercies has, according to Peter, granted us every great and precious gift in Christ. Everything that's good that's in Christ is yours. He who did not spare his own son, but give him up for us all, how will he not also give us all things, including righteousness for which we uh, desire. It's Christ's righteousness becomes our righteousness, Luther writes in the same sermon. Uh, the apostle calls it the righteousness of God in Romans 1.7 that we get by faith. Well, I want to I give the presupposition for the double atonement, uh, the double imputation, and then I'm going to turn finally to the Old Testament argument that's missed, been missed. The first place when you're thinking of justification, the way Luther did, or the way we should, would of course be to do a word study and see how the word justify is used in the Bible. And what we learn is God hates justifying the wicked. He loathes it. He condemns it. He calls it an abomination to justify the wicked. Because N.T. Wright and others are correct, justification is forensic. Uh, the the so-called new perspective, all agree with traditional theology. When you hear the term justify, you think courtroom. The court is the background for it. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. They are the foundations of his throne, according to Psalm 89. So therefore, in Exodus 23, in God's law, it says, do not deny justice to your poor in their lawsuits. Have nothing to do with a false charge. Don't put an innocent or honest person to death. For I will not justify the wicked. That's what God says. In Deuteronomy 25, when men have a dispute, they're to take it to the court, and the judges will decide the case, justifying the righteous and condemning the guilty. That's what you're supposed to do. You justify the righteous, you condemn the guilty. In Proverbs 17, he who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. You justify the wicked, this just is repulsive to a God of holiness and justice and righteousness. That's, and we could say, by the way, the New Testament has the exact same, lots of examples, use your concordance. Uh, next, then, we add to that the fact that we're all guilty sinners, right? I mean, you, get, you start with those two presuppositions. One, you have a holy God that hates justifying the wicked, then you have, I'm the wicked. <laughs> Who can say, I've kept my heart pure and I'm clean without sin? What shall we conclude? Are we any better? No, we've all already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. As it says, there's no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. Forget getting to rung to, you'll never get there, of St. John's uh, ladder. Uh, no one, according to the Bible, really loves God and seeks him. We want to, you know, we're upset when we get caught. We want, you know, help, whatever. But our heart is in desperate shape. And, and meanwhile, not only are we in trouble in general, uh, we're even worse off. Uh, because it turns out God will accept nothing but perfect righteousness. Far beyond, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's what, that's what Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount. Our righteousness will never be enough to deserve eternal life, to merit it. So here then comes the good news. If God, who hates justifying the wicked, justifies you and me, how can that happen? It can only happen if he makes us righteous. Otherwise, he'll do that which he loathes and abominates. And so the text over and over again in the book of Romans, this righteousness is from God, comes through faith in Jesus Christ who all, to, who all, who, to all who believe there is no difference for all who sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Why, why did he do it? He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just, the one who hates justifying the wicked, and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. If you didn't have his righteousness, he couldn't do both. 
John Piper put it this way, the wisdom of God has ordained a way for the love of God to deliver us from the wrath of God without compromising the justice of God. So a God who has announced over and over again his hatred of justifying the wicked can justify you and me because he gives us righteousness that is not our own. And the same point, of course, is made in Romans 5 in the, in the two Adam scheme, through one act, you know, you get a death, and through the other act, you get the gift of righteousness, as he describes it in, Je in Romans 5. It, Romans 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 5. Uh, you know, we no longer regard anyone from a worldly point of view. In fact, we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. So we have a whole new pair of eyes. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. God has made him who had no sin to be sin for us, the imputation of sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There's, there, there is the two-directional imputation. Philippians 3, likewise. Oh, what is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ my Lord. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is, in, is by faith. Now I'm going to tell you a little secret, and I don't really want to go beyond here. Well, so in uh, 2009, I had the privilege at Park Street Church of inviting, uh, as guest preachers and subsequent months, uh, both John Piper and Tom Wright, N.T. Wright. And some of you may know they had actually at that point just written books against each other. And I had both... When I had uh, Piper present, and he came, joined us, my wife and me, for lunch, I made sure he could see the N.T. Wright book. And when I had N.T. Wright, I made sure he... And it was clear both were very puzzled why I would invite them, uh, given that I was inviting the other. In fact, had they known it, perhaps... No, I, I'd like to think them better of them. They, they would still have been willing. But uh, they might not have been willing to come. And uh, in... in I will admit, admit I, I, I'm much more persuaded by Piper and his treatment of the New Testament text. But when I got to Tom Wright, I said, you know, I think I know why you're not persuaded by Piper. And now he just had written a whole book, so, you know, but okay. Uh, you think that explains it. But no, there's actually a, an explanation behind the explanation. And that is, in the case of the imputation of sin, we got a ton of Old Testament parallels for it where the priest confesses a sin on the animal, and the animal dies, and so on. There's, it seemed in reading Piper's defense, there's nothing virtually in the Old Testament that prepares for the imputation of righteousness. And how could something be so important and not have an Old Testament background? And if you know N.T. Wright, I've read his wonderful books, all worth reading. He's a biblical theologian. He loves reading the New Testament through the eyes of the Old. And if it isn't there, then he's got to find another way to handle the New Testament text. So where is it? Well, there are a few, you know, little texts, Genesis 15, Psalm 32, you can kind of look at, but they're not strong enough. What had not been noticed was, of course, animals aren't righteous, so you can't get imputed righteousness, even symbolically, from a lamb. What do you get it from? Well, you get it from what Jewish theology calls the zakuth avoth, the merits of the patriarchs. Uh, there's a whole devotional, whole theological development that is attested in the second, third century uh, of Judaism, very early on the rabbinic period, and then later it gets kind of carried away. But it starts and really builds around Genesis 22 to begin with. Let me just quickly finish up here. Okay, I've got to land the plane. Five, give me four minutes. <laughs> this, in Genesis 22, you have the Akedah, the binding of Isaac. When they reached the place, God told them Abraham built an altar there. And, you know, I think about what that meant. I mean, you've heard sermons about it. Just here at the end of Abraham's life, he's doing what he was called to do at the beginning. There's a lot of vocabulary shared between chapter 12 and chapter 22. And you know, it's just astounding. And, of course, Hebrews tells us he could only have done this because God had promised it would be through 
Isaac that your seed will be reckoned. And therefore, he must have believed that if he did this to Isaac, Isaac, you know, either would turn to jello on the way down or that Isaac would be resurrected, literally or figuratively, because God can't not keep his word. It's got to be through Isaac. How can you kill him if it's got to be through Isaac? Not just through your son. That might have gotten switched to some other kid. Isaac is the one. In Genesis 22, the angel of the Lord called Abraham from heaven a second time. I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possessions of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you, not them, because you have obeyed me. We have transferred righteousness from Abraham even to this day in the liturgy of Rosh Hashanah among our Jewish brothers and sisters. It said, why does one blow the shofar taken from the ram? The Holy One, blessed be he, said, blow a ram's horn before me so I will remember in your behalf the binding of Isaac, son of Abraham, and count it to you as though you had bound yourself as a sacrifice before me. The willingness of the founding father Abraham to sacrifice his son is proof of his devotion of God created an inexhaustible store of spiritual credit which future, on which future generations could draw. Now that's, you know, some people think of that as a development, a, a defensive polemic against Christianity, but it wasn't. It's already there in the text. And so when God ministers, you know, calls Isaac, he reminds them, I'm doing this to you. I'm giving you. The Lord appeared to Isaac in Genesis 26. I'll be with you, Isaac and bless you, and your descendants will be given all the lands, and will con- you know, you're, you're going to have success in the conquest of Canaan. You may not stay there, but you're going to get in there because of the obedience of Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and, because, and will give them all the lands, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because Abraham obeyed me and kept my requirements. It's not because you. It's because of him. God comes down on a ladder not because of Jacob, He's appallingly unappealing. (laughs) But because of Abraham and what Abraham did. And it goes on to David, by the way. The same kind of stuff is said about David, if you read it in Kings, why it was that God didn't let the kingdom fall apart. It was because of David, substantial obedience. Because David is the son of Abraham. And Jesus is the son of David, the son of Abraham. And so the prophets talk about one who comes whose name will be the Lord is my righteousness. The ultimate son of David, that's his name. The Lord is my righteousness. God has given us his own righteousness in this ultimate son of David who comes. So now I will close with my friend Richard Loveless. Richard Loveless in his wonderful book on the dynamics of spiritual life. Some readers will be surprised that in a 455-page book called The Dynamics of Spiritual Life, that I have not devoted more time to techniques and regimens of spiritual development, programs of meditation, fasting, vocal and mental prayer, the use of diaries, spiritual directors, and the intricate ladders by which the believer is assumed to climb from acquired to infuse contemplation. I have no bias against these aids, and I deeply respect the great saints of the church who have found them helpful, but they can intimidate those who are young in the faith, and my intention here has been to construct a little rule for beginners, as Benedict would say. Ladders are always intimidating, and it is my suspicion that Christians should always assume that they start each day at the top of the ladder in contact with God and renew this assumption whenever they appear to have slipped a rung. (laughs) You begin your day not, you know, with God having noticed you failed yesterday's exam, therefore, but he's going to expunge the failing grade and you get to take a makeup today. It's not the promise of a makeup every day. You start at the bottom and have to prove yourself again. Every day you start with an A plus average. Every day you start, and every day in the middle of the day, if you believe in the doctrine of justification as Luther unfolded it for us. 
May your life reflect that kind of confidence. And may your growth in sanctification come out of it based on his, you know, in, in, uh, in, in his imputed righteousness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to reflect on the great truths of your word, and may our lives be a demonstration of it. May we, may we repent of any attempt to ingratiate ourselves with you, of the silliness of trying to engineer a Christian life. But may we instead follow Christ, cleave to him, believe only in him, and have him be our righteousness, in whose name we pray. Amen.